thank you for coming. I may I spend a couple minutes to pay homage. Uh, I have a number of people uh, I should mention. So I got really lucky. Uh, Eighty nine case gave me a job. They treated me so nice, nicely, kindly, and uh, I told them right away that I won't get tenure based on what I know. Uh, meaning, uh, so. They still trusted me, and and uh, I, I realized uh, the polymer problem is so complicated. I need to do experiment, and luckily, I still remember Ken. You were the first one. He is in a polymer interface. He told me one day, he says, "The is working on Wasio," and soon we get the BP project. Eric, because of you, I got supported with a project to work on Wasio problem. So if that's the connection. Capillary rheometer is coming from Ken's group. And you guys just treat me so nice, so so kindly that uh, uh, just on the record, I got tenured without a major federal grant. Just imagine how nicely, kindly they treat me. So in any case, uh, any more to say? I mean, I can say forever about, uh, uh, about uh, my feeling of coming home. Oops. Uh, uh, about coming home, uh, uh, pay homage. Uh, so now it's for the students. So we are living in the spheres of polymer science engineering, uh, and you know, it's a big scale. And I would claim that half of our concerns should be about mechanics, because we use them mainly because of their adequate mechanical characteristics. But the problem is very hard, and there are many facets to it. So let me uh, sort of try to be a good uh, teacher, quiz you with uh, what is the most important variable in problem, and what are the two landscapes that you learn from your courses. You should, you should all know it's molecular weight, and the two land scales are cone lens and packing lens. If you haven't heard about packing lens, read something, and certainly you can read my book that has a part of it. These parameters, these parameters determine what I will concentrate today, the strength of problem. And you may even ask, gee, I have this poor strength, can I blame covalent bond strength for it? That it's not strong. What is the external parameter most important for problem? Excuse me, bunch of What's the external parameter? Come on. We don't have time. Oh my God, it touched my heart. <laughs> yes. So in any case, we are going to attempt to build SP, a PSP uh, by, wow, I have AI. It just want on itself. And, uh, I choose a, a very uh, intriguing title because much of what I say is the gene style scaling. It can get you very far, but maybe not far enough. So remind you what we call a polymer ductile versus brittle. I mean, for God's sake, if, we, if I have to demonstrate, I will show you what, uh, show me, uh, what, what a brittle means, what ductile means. But this is it. You, you take a sample intention, if it breaks, when the force is still climbing, that's great. This would include your very stretchable rubber because it does that. Otherwise, you have what the ductility, you have so-called a yield stress to think about. It. So uh, you can uh, go into a little detail about uh, the different parts of this world uh, in liquid state, in solid state. And to save some time, I'm not even going to play these movies that I will uh, show them later again. So let me just uh, 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 tell you why I think what I did was a tour of three uh, continents. So the three continents being rheology, uh, mechanical characteristics of plastics, and factory mechanics. I borrow the map. So uh, it turns out uh, there are many large areas concerning uh, mechanics, 
where we have yet to answer some of the fundamental questions. So I first focused on this polymer problem, uh, in reality problem in the multi-state. It turns out related to processing. It turns out what we need to ask is, is there a structure associated with my mail where when I subject it to large fast deformation, can the structure break apart? What kind of structure are, are, are we talking about? And secondly, uh, so what I'm trying to do is basically a tour as a sightseeing in three continents and I show you what I see on each continent uh, in terms of the major question that seems to be still there to be answered uh, when I jump into this uh, very well uh, plotted field. So for example, I should be intrigued and you should be too, a glassy polymer. How come it is a doctor can flow? I cannot venture because I don't know what is this material. Oops, this doesn't flow. So this must be polystyrene. But, but this one is not brittle, that's polyethylene. Polycarbonate is not brittle. Uh, many materials are not brittle. So we want to understand where the dark feeling comes from. And then what does semi crystalline what does crystallization do to the mechanics of polymer? And finally, uh, recently uh, we started to see a, a different light in terms of how to think about waking our polymers. So as I said, these are large subjects, uh, many books written on them. And uh, I start to uh, write one book based on what we learned about reality. And it seems there's more I can say about the rest of the subject. So I was uh, convinced that I have to write my second book, uh, which is really burdensome. So I will have to uh, work very hard. So let me uh, remind you, polymer either exists in elastomeric state or plastic state and thermostat in the middle. Can that's your work. Uh, even the linear response problem was already hard enough. We have rubber elasticity theory, far from being perfect. And glassy state is difficult to describe. Crystallization is complicated, let alone when you go to nonlinear response, large deformation. Breaking takes place with rubber. There is issue of whether your polymer is ductile or brittle. And finally, it seems what connects these two plastic versus elastomers is fraction my hand, which I hope to spend half the time talking. I color-coded my generations of students who contributed to this three or four field. Without their uh, de dedication, uh, none of what I say uh, 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 could, could become uh, reality. So in any case, this is our third point. We learn from reality, your polymer should be thought of as this if you magnify a million times. I'm teaching you here what packing lines mean. Polystyrene will be this white line, polyethylene will be this thing, red line. That's what packing lines amounts to. The narrowness of the molecular cross-section of your gem. And it turns out there are certain characteristics about the fact your clean lines, uh, your cold lines is hardly Changing, but your packing lines is changing greatly among all the common problems. So uh, I know I don't have enough time, but let me give you the first uh, lesson when you do reality. You put a sample in between shear plate, you shear, and you know exactly how much time it takes to make 100% definition. And that time is controlled by the V you have. And if that time is much smaller than your maximum relaxation time, you know what's going to happen. The chain is not going to wait to diffuse and relax. So you're going to smash your sample and you're not doing the uh, overshoot point. If you check any dictionary, you scientific dictionary, you will learn that this point should be a U because the elastic deformation, the characteristic, the elastic feature that the stress grow uh, with stretching or shear uh, season at this point. So here are, forget it, uh, here, look at the first two books. 
It turns out, I just want you to take, have a take home message. It turns out, Bryce Maxwell from Princeton, in 79, he had plenty of experience with plastic. He recognized this point as yield point. The very same year, two model number four paper was published to show that I can spit out this overshoot without thinking about structural breakdown. So from there on, this idea of this being yield is completely forgotten. The rest is history. I want to tease you by showing you this was the outline of my rheology course at Case in 1995. So basically, these are the facts that I covered to kill time. Sorry, I mean, I, I'm so critical, including critical myself. And this is even a current outline of the rheology course offered at that time. Uh, almost nothing was available for you to say very much about the nonlinear reality. So what is nonlinear reality? Oh God, uh, I, I have a three hour lecture summarizing the book. I have a whole semester of course of all the lectures based on my book and YouTube. So I'm gonna be more than sketchy and it's all of these questions are addressed. One of the key point was to look at your, go to your sample, this is a millimeter, you build a device, you want to see if this is true or not. I know, so uh, it, it would be uh, crazy that if you haven't seen this movie. So this movie is about 18 years old. So it was shared uniformly, except now it breaks apart, okay? So this movie uh, really uh, informed us there's something really nasty going on. You don't have homogeneous shear as we learned from testing. And it turns out that this happens just right after the point of maximum. Yielding takes place, structure is inhomogeneously breaking apart. So it turns out that you can find that this is true uh, also by learning about the physics of the, you can find out this is true also in extension. So for example, I can do a uh, extension and stretch my filament. You can predict after a while, the sample will break apart. So that's sort of new physics and therapy. It was in fact predicted before we went to the lab for sure. So I'm not going to be able to go to the whole nine yards and just to show you the last one for the sake of Joe. That in extension, if you stretch something, this is just the total force. You find the total force reach a maximum, that's an indication of a yield again. The force is unable to build up further at some magic point where the structure is forced to break apart. So it turns out that they are, uh, I, I guess uh, I'm gonna run out of time, so I, I'm not gonna show you all the movies, except to say that uh, it really breaks apart depending on how fast you're stretching, they break apart very uh, differently. For example, look at how it breaks apart there, passing the maximum versus how, how it breaks up there, passing the maximum. So I'm gonna skip to the last movie, which shows it can break up as if it was crossly, although it was without that. I'm gonna, forgive me, I'm gonna skip this whole slide. This is the theory slide, the punchline. It turns out when you stretch a polymer network, you deform it elastically, but that the elastic deformation cannot continue forever. There will be a 14 balance point at which time the, uh, the red chain ceases to be further stretched. In fact, it, it will start to come back as this revelation. That's it. So we wrote, I wrote a whole book on this and all the details are there. Let me switch to, to the continent too, what, what showing you what I saw in the side scene. Uh, I was absolutely uh, fascinated by the idea about by the fact that the polymers are uh, duct, uh, polymer glasses. So these are the books that talk about them. And this is one movie using our camera, stretching a piece of polypropylene, opportunity, and they quote unquote flow. I mean, they don't break, but they nicely undergo so-called precisely plastic deformation. So how come on earth you can do that? And then beyond uh, amorphous material, 
you may have some crystallinity that further complex, complicate the problem. But really, uh, let me just quickly say, in reality, about PG, PM, uh, you have, I just showed you, which we should perceive them as made of uh, a chain network. And that chain network, of course, is preserved when you cool down to the glassy state. In addition, all the monomers stuck in glassy state. And so in, in, in reality, you parameterize all the chemical differences through some friction coefficient, and the rest is only about 10 lengths, the molecular weight. Remember the very first parameter that I told you about. And in uh, glassy state, it turns out one has to understand the structure of this network. Uh, this is what got me started. Textbook says, as late as at, uh, 2012, works Bible, that they explain gradual ductal transition as follows. This side is, on this side is ductal, on the other side is brittle, and they think uh, somehow some kind of yield process concurrently competing with the grating process, whatever causes lower stress uh, or wind. So I tend to tease my student when I teach and ask my student this uh, question. Uh, tell me uh, what this textbook said in terms of uh, uh, in terms of uh, what what this hypothesis really said. What well, it said really very little. So I know uh, we're not uh, amateur. We know how to think about doctor behavior. You have basically you have an activation barrier. You apply stress, activation barrier lower. Eventually, you achieve a mobility. Except what's important is that the stress that lower the barrier has to be delivered, prescribed by a structure. So uh, this is where our contribution comes in. So in any event, uh, it turns out there are five factors uh, influencing the following. If you take a PMMA, it's brittle at 50 degrees. If you go to 60, that PMMA turns stuck. Why? So I'm uh, going to be sketchy here. So th there are uh, uh, different factors influencing uh, 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 this transition. And I just want to show you uh, two simple cases. So this is the polystyrene is brittle. And this is the po same polystyrene after male stretching, it become completely factor. A phenomenon known for 60 years. And the magician's game was something that you know you should be impressed by. It. This is polystyrene. It's brittle, passing through the plural mill. A magician has done something and it's not that way. No change in chemistry, right? In either case. So it turns out that I have to try to formulate the idea of what male stretching does. I introduce this concept called content, uh, geometric condensation. So after male stretching, you have a totally different object. At the end of the day, I know I still need to be sketchy. All this is public and even talked about in my YouTube channel. But basically, you have this network. You recognize this network is what is trying to drive facility, deliver mobility, because you are using certain ways to displace this network. The neighboring monomers just try to follow a line, a follow a line. And if it's too cold, it won't be able to follow along before the network falls apart. So this little data transition problem is Goldilocks temperature. When it's too cold, the network cannot deliver the mobility and, and activation. And you just need it to be warm enough. As a byproduct, I can estimate what would be the stress at this point. It should be just the network density, area density of the low bearing bond and the critical force at which the network will fall apart. Meaning when the strand build enough tension to reach FCP, CP stands for chain core. If you reach that point, the network can collapse without causing enough motiva uh, mo uh, uh, mobilization in the, in the material. So you can see, that uh, uh, this is the just say X Y, so so the drawing is outside of the screen, and you can see the activation zone, which is the, the lighter region, it cannot percolate through below the point. So in any case, I have a notion of how, and 
here is the here is the uh, packing line. The structure of this network turns out is sensitive to the packing lines as one over p. So at the end of the day, it turns out my model can explain the, this powerful observation of a dozen polymer where the stress at the rate of dazzle transition deals with the molecular cross section of the chain. And it, it follows this uh, beautiful linear scale. So I, I'm not going to, I, I'm running out of time to give you any detail. And it turns out that structure is not an entanglement network, which you would not give you a linear network. It is, turns out it's a network due to, uh, uh, due to this uh, uh, chain flexibility, actually. So I know uh, uh, I need to move on. And uh, uh, the semi-Christian part is so much more complicated. So I, I don't think I have enough time to get deep into crystallization of power, such a vast subject. But I do want to ask a trivial question. That is, uh, if I have this uh, sphere life, I can go downward, I can try to see in the domains of the sphere life, you see the lamella, I can see the lamella is, is participated by each chain. Some chains are crystalline, some chains are amorphous. And then if you go backward all the way, the, the chain network through uncrossability is going to form a network. So it inspired me to think, while I was in melt state, I had this network. Why, why I cool down to have crystallization? I need to ask whether, how much my crystallization has disrupted my channel. So this is all can be quantitatively viewed in terms of high chains and, and effect of entanglement. But I really have, uh, uh, I'm not expert and I, I won't be able to spend too much effort on it. But it, what concerns me is this so-called dual healing. You take your high density polyethylene. If the crystallization is too much, the high density polyethylene is not dual. Whereas linear low, which has which does not have a lot of crystallization, it draws beautiful. Polycarp, you know, poly PM, uh, polypropylene draws or not, depending on how you have produced the morphology that disrupted or not disrupted the chain network. So in any case, there are many parameters that including our beer temperature and the drawing rate and the morphology and different polymers behave differently. So this is a mess here. Uh, and uh, I, uh, I, I just want to show you one example where we have some success. Uh, PLA is known to be very brittle. I'm going to apply this so-called geometric transition uh, effect because polystyrene of the joint becomes ductile. So PLA should be able to ensure ductility that way too. Except I have the actual benefit because PLA also crystallized. So I can envision drawing my network to have chain orientation such that around the, the aligned chain, you have crystallization taking place at the mesh size level, at the mesh size level. And all the chains are trying to compete and add it to this nucleating site. Pretty quickly, they frustrated. They, there is no way for this crystal to grow. So it will become crystals at the size of the mesh size of the network. Therefore, it's necessarily nano. And here comes the world first, I claim. Super top heat resistant transparent PLA top. It's uh, uh, heat resistant because you have plenty of crystallization. Melting is way above 100 degrees C. And it's ductile because of the jumping condensation. And it's transparent because the crystals are also. So, uh, I end up uh, happy and happy that they allow me to publish this paper back to back, very long papers. I, I didn't bribe the editor, but I succeeded. Uh, it's the end of it. I, I, uh, I, I certainly own a dinner privately. Privately, right? Uh, so this is all I can do. So let me switch to uh, the problem. Huh. Let me switch to the problem of of, I see I have lost the title of it. So this is the continent three. So let me go through this, uh, my current passion. Uh, I'm trying to calculate my time. So I, I, was, I was planning to use half of my time on this. Uh, 
I jumped on this because of what we learned, just learned uh, uh, about the strength of police direct, for example. So let me give you this whole nine yards. I know fashion mechanics is not in our courses, typically. So let me go fairly slow uh, and, and not feel rushed about it. Fractal mechanics occurred because we thought the nominal, the observed strength is so much weaker than the ideal possible strength we could have. So it turns out for glasses, it's true. The strength of glasses ideally should be about seven gigapascal. Instead, we only observe 100. Okay. So here goes. The first paper on this is to dig a hole in your sheet, a little hole, and we predicted that the stress at the two poles will intensify much larger than the overall load by a factor that diverges when the radius of curvature, the diameter, when this hole becomes infinitely thin. thin. And that's nasty. So the stress diverges. Nobody likes that. In fact, Griffiths didn't like it. So Griffiths went ahead to adopt an energy argument saying, hey, I know one fracture occurred. It's one, uh, one, when I grow, if my fracture, if a little more uh, uh, of, the, uh, of the opening goes, mm. then I will have less ability to store energy. Conversely, it means that energy will be released. If that energy is enough to pay for the energy required to create a new surface, then I should have fracking. So this is the great idea. From that idea through this uh, little very simple uh, level of scaling, you will be able to find the famous uh, Griffiths law that the critical load at factor is related to the size of the crack as one over the square root. So this is famous. I shied away from that result for 30 years because fraction mechanics it was so foreign to me at that time. So it turns out you can be more careful. You can do a more sophisticated calculation to find out the stress diverges as you approach the tip as one over r square root. So when my r approaches to zero, it diverges. People hate that because nothing diverges. And they introduce the idea, hey, the stress, uh, the material must not tolerate that stress and reach a point of yield and, and propose a, 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 a picture like this. And then turns out that K can be related to, to the Griffiths uh, so-called energy release rate in this manner. In any case, at the end of the day, we were told by in textbook that the fraction of time stands on two pillars. You can either think about it in terms of the stress concentration at the craft chip or in terms of the energy release required to create new surface. I know this is a busy slide, but this is really the concept. Now we look at polymer. So fraction mechanics is 100 years old, starting with studying glasses. Polymer people learned about it 70 years ago. And I would say we were somewhat confused about, about the validity of fracture mechanics in the following sense. As I just told you, hold on this polystyrene. You break it at about 50 megapascal, okay? How do you know your inherent strength, meaning the strength idealized is 50 megapascal or much higher. You look at the textbooks, you'll be confused about how people think about this. People go to the fiber limit, it's in the book. I, I have no time to say. To go, you can go to the fiber limit where you assume each of the loads where you assume each of the bonds bear low, and all the bond breaks at fraction, you'll get a strength of 15 gigapascals for your fiber. It's in Cleveland Museum, Science Museum. They have a demonstration. My polymer fiber is stronger than your steel because we harvested all the covalent bond strength. But that's not the theoretical, 
That's not ideal strength for your isotropic polystyrene, which is a coil. So it, it seems to me, based on my experience, it's not 50 gigapascal. There is a factor of one times here, one times here. The 50 megapascal that you nominally observe, I suspect it is your intrinsic strength. Then you know the game. Don't blame stress intensification. Don't blame flaws. Same with rubber. Rubber is a disaster. I'm not going to even go. I'm going to be, it, it, it's, it's the same disaster. It's much worse. It go from the, uh, there it's even, it's just a disaster. We can never produce a good rubber. So weak. Because according to the fact, if all these bonds bear low, okay, we should have three gigapascal such time. Instead, we have 10 gigapascal. Okay? It's a disaster. So, let me, I hope I, um, I hope I get to, to the, the right point. Ah, this slide should have come first. This is the continent series where I'm do, doing my sightseeing. My question, the question I raise, is polymer really flaw tolerant or intolerant? All the textbooks talk about how polymer is ruined by flaws, just like window glasses do. Three books on okay, so I'm not going to go. I'm going to just like look, flaw, flaw, all over the place. That's for rubber. Uh, uh, for plastic, both are in case, uh, in both cases, they're probably flawed. Okay, so here's the central question. Is your nominal strength much lower than the intrinsic strength? If it is, fresh and mechanical people tell you what to do. You perceive you have such a low strength, you have uh, the so-called nominal, because you have flaw. And then to learn about it, we just go to the lab, actually make a flaw, meaning make a car. From there, you use with this approach, you can estimate what is the toughness so called DC. And then you plug that toughness into this formula. You can now pretend to prescribe the nominal strength with the caveat. You don't have an independent theory that prescribes the size of the flaw. Totally unknown. So it's 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 logically flawed. I mean, logically not uh, not complete. So 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 I raised a question three years ago. I, I jumped in because because I was not sure the last question was the answer. Nominal strength in hand strength for our polymers is this true? So how do we? So now you see the key. We know how to get normal strength. Close your eyes, take a piece of sample, right? So-called uncut sample, you get the normal strength. It's about comparing that to the inherent strength. How do we know? What is the inherent strength? I did, right? In continent two, we had some sense, theoretically, a feeling that my normal strength is not much different than intrinsic strength. Okay, I don't believe my theory. In fact, speak up the gen, let me speak one word about it. It's a scaling argument. The prefactor is missing. I have no way of telling you I miss a factor of 10 here, another factor of 10 there or not. Then what I do? I mean, I, I, I so appreciate being my formative years at the, at the case. I call this place one. I learned to internalize theory and experiment in what? So if I cannot achieve it convincingly what it is theoretically, let me find the experimental approach. So I have a very trivial uh, 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 proposal to, 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 to my students. You have a crack, you have a tip. You know, I, mean, I go to the tip, and quantify the stress at the tip when it breaks. If that stress is comparable to my nominal strength, 
that I know what is my inherent strength. In other words, I claim that the stress at this hip at fracture will be the inherent stress. Well, it turns out you'd have to be really lucky for that idea to work. Thanks God, polymer is just a perfect material that this idea works. So I'm going to say that, of course, you can deal with the brittle plastic. I'm heavily uh, interested in this more complicated problem, adaptive plastic, and then the elastomer. My God, at Akron, I, I always wanted to, to elastomize. Fracture mechanic is what allowed this uh, a possible. So, I already told you what, how we're going to do it, right? So we're going to uh, use biofringence as a way of at least finding out how chains are being stretched. So it turns out that when you have a, 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 a white light, you can just have an anchor sample. You can establish the relationship between the retardants to this micro levy chart and the stress that you in strong measure. So you have a so-called stress optical relationship with the anchor. With that, I can now examine what happens when you have a cut. I know this movie already is finished, yet, but basically, you should have a loop here. So basically, we have a cut. We can see how this color changes at the tip and try your best to resolve it. I know I cut it this maybe a little bit, so you can see it. So in any case, so this this is uh, this is uh, maybe again. So we are taking this pillar two approach. The stress building up, the amount of stress building up is dictated by this parameter. It's called K. Please remember it. It's a it has a operational definition. The K is nothing but the stress far here, far away, and the size of the cut. So if we do this patiently and try to resolve it. 4K movie, I mean, blow it up, go pixel by pixel. It turns out uh, you end up looking at this uh, build up of butterfly like pattern. And by resolving the RGBs, the color chain, you can resolve the stress level. And here we find that when you first load with very little stress, the stress as your code is here, it's probably like one over R minus one half. So going to the right, is approaching the tip, right? It, it, the R goes to infinity is at the tip. This is fundamentally important. We find the stress rolls as you approach the tip, just like the theory says, it should diverge as you approach the tip. Then it's saturated. It's saturated at the level of 100 microns, let's say, easily resolved. Such that I can claim I really do know the stress at the tip. You see, if this keeps growing, I won't be able to tell where it will stop growing, but it does stop growing. So if you plot the stress at the tip and uh, as a function of how much you are stretching, when I go, it's a linear relationship with that tail, which is the degree of stretching. The tip stress keep growing linearly with how much you are expecting. And the slope, it's just so funny. K has this strength dimension, it's stress times the length scale scale root. So the slope turns out reveals a new, a new. It reveals a characteristic length scale. Just jump at you. And then if you look at this a little further, you realize that, oh my God, this is the, the, the tip. Ah, for people who, who are not familiar with fracture mechanics, it, it, it may not be easy to appreciate. What I learned fracture mechanics, I got so frustrated, is the fact people say fracture occurs when this so-called stress intensification factor K goes to KC, which means the stress reaches some bigger load called sigma C. It's an operational definition. It allows the experimental list to determine the value of KC. But it doesn't tell you what's the physics involved in determining KC. But this experiment that shows this linearity holds all the way to the point of that. That's the that, that, that. Tells you two things. Not only 
and it tells you the, the hit stress reaching just 40 megapascal. PMMA, the nominal stress is 60 megapascal. I'm reading only 50, 40 megapascals at the tip because of trans uh, yeah, That's a, 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 a taking time. But so this relation survives all the way to the point of fracture, you mean what? On the left is what I propose. The tip stress at fracture should be just behind stress. Now, you've got a new expression for KC. KC is the inherent stress times P square root. Okay? This is like no tomorrow. You've got an operational definition of KC where I learned fashion mechanics. It tells me nothing about why the KC is constant, what determines magnitude. What through this last time we learned? Oh, it's a constant because your inherent stress is a constant. It's a constant because P is potentially a material specific from landscape. So not only I, 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 I learned KC is constant, I also learned what is its magnitude. It's determined by the strength of your polymer and the P. What is P? Is this saturation zone, the stress stop flow, we call it. Uh, a stress saturation one, RSF. And in the literature, you have a spread. Well, that's because when you prepare the, uh, the crack, the tip varies, and that has very, it produced variations in P. So in short, I'm going to skip the uh, plastic part. Uh, I, I'm actually almost done. I'm also uh, going to uh, uh, be brief on the elastic part. So in any case, we can do the same, not only for plastic, but for elastomer. Elastomer, for this particular one, is very biofringent. So instead of a, a white light, we just use monochromatic light. So you can capture every uh, uh, order in terms of the retarding. It has a lot of retarding. For example, you reach 11. Uh, uh, so this is just the movie shown. With, and you indeed have to patiently resolve to the tip and plot your biofringent as a function of distance toward the tip, and you find it tends to saturate. And if you report that value at the tip against how far you have stretched, it's a linear line again. And uh, therefore, I have reached some sort of conclusion contrasting what I think is fracture mechanics for color. Fraction mechanics with brittle solid typically is described this way. The nominal stress is prescribed by how large is your flow. So just for your information, I pull it back. Our silicon glasses, such as window glasses, tend to have a flow on the, uh, on the order of one micron. And that produces a nominal stress of about 100 meter And uh, uh, this, because the theory says it should divert, there is a remedy to it, and suggests that there is a plastic remedy, just as such, as I have described again. What we find ourselves experimentally is this. Can you see the difference between these two? So we are advancing that the tip stress never just right away should be limiting real stress value. It progressively linearly grows with the law. Uh, our ability to say so is because there is stress saturation zone that is resolvable. So let me say resolvable. Look at this red line. If my resolution is this red line, you tell me, can I tell the difference between this two scenario? Yes. Yes or no? Yeah. If, oh my, sorry. I think that's the AI thing. Yeah, okay. If my resolution is this red line, would I be able to tell the difference between those two scenarios? Yes? You see, we always have a really hard to uh, uh, do as much no. Look at the red. If, what, what do I mean by resolution here? Meaning I have no ability to know any information beyond the point towards zero. Okay, all the information available is to the right of the red line. 
In that case, can you tell the difference between the two? Yes or no? I'm saying if we cover everything to the left of the red line, are uh, they not look the same? Mm -hmm. Yes, of course. So luckily, or lucky, goodness, for plastic and for rubber, it turns out this red line is not is is approaching uh, basically. <laughs> basically, I'm saying that. Uh, That our resolution is so much better than this red line, such that we have this full information and we see this looks qualitatively different than this. So, uh, so let me summarize. So, basically, uh, if you can estimate the inclined stress, then your job is to compare with normal stress. If your nominal strength is much lower than the inherent strength, then you need fraction account, just like you can see here. There is stress constant here and all that. But even there, when you need to make a cut to learn about fraction account, uh, and this is a bit uh, uh, of a, a, a punchline, maybe it's slightly difficult for you to appreciate. When you have a, a problem of fraction mechanics in the sense of a uh, factor in presence of a, a crack. You have introduced the length here. So it turns out the problem cannot be described by stress alone. It must be described by some quantity that involves both stress and the landscape. Operationally, indeed, the toughness involves the stress and the landscape, which is the size of the block. But I was different. I, I call this operational definition because this operational definition gives me no insight about why DC is uh, a constant. Because you see, this is not a micro problem. This is just what you measure. So don't forget, when you have a flaw, you actually introduce no landscape. Why is it size? One is how sharp that crack is. Involving the sharpness of that crack, I also have a landscape. I also have a stress, which is the inherent stress. So for the same idea of toughness, I no longer need to think about operational expression. I have a materialistic expression that tells me why GC is constant or KC is constant and why what determines its magnitude. So the rest is clear. If the nominal strands and inherent strands are comparable, you just go back, worry about, cut or figure out what determines the strength. It's not a fraction mechanical problem anymore. And this is one we call the material stress uh, a flaw in sand. And we, we come back, we use fraction mechanics only when the crack is very low. I just want to remind you, when you use packaging, don't you normally see they make a, they make a little notch so you can peer? And that's where they are trying to take advantage of fraction mechanics. I totally run out of time. Uh, there is a massive subject. I tell you, it's so, so intriguing, it's not fun. It caused me to lose sleep, but we have some uh, 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 way to handle it. What happens is this, take a piece of rubber, could be your tire. That rubber is very weak, let's say at room temperature. If you cool down 30 degrees, that rubber simply magically become much stronger. Okay, it's known for 70 years. As if given dry surface, my tire in the, I can predict my tire in the winter have lower wearing loss than in the summer. It would be the same thing. 70 years. Giant, many giants work on. I run out of time. 
we work heavily on this right now. We already have our first manuscript copy, copy, uh, in print, in press. Totally different than the understanding that's in textbook. People think this whole idea of the material is stronger at the low, the water that is stronger at the lower temperature because they think about toughness all in terms of this energy consideration, the energy release. I came from the understanding the structure is dictated by stress, reaching certain strength. So I'm uh, 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 looking into another way to rationalize this entirely different by blaming that your covalent bond is more stable at the lower temperature against dissociation. Uh, I mean, the you know, I, I'm pretty clear that this will be what, what happens to you. So, so why do I say I have the three components? Well, you can see it. The fracture mechanism, we can bring a different perspective and then only because I learned from this continent, Saisi, knowing what strength means, how I can determine this. Well, how do I learn that your polymer is not operable? Only because I learned through reality that, that give me the experience, the unprocessibility of chains is essential to speak about this amorphous structure. And similarly, I need to worry about how crystallization disrupt that network. So you can see, you can see what I today call, I today call reality where I started here. I skipped a few slides about what's live and all that, if you want. Reality where I started at case is the mother of everything. We have all the insight about because it's so convenient. It, it, you don't break it, right? But you still learn the structure in reality. So, so as I said, this three continent is built, all of this must be done in this sequence. Understanding reality, figure out ductility and mechanics of plastic, and then you will have a new insight about that of your problem. So why do we do that? Because Processing structure, mechanical properties. I talked to students during the long time. We were spoiled. All our polymer have adequate mechanical characteristics. Polypropylene, polyethylene, we, things go on and on. We're so spoiled, we don't need to learn when it is not good. Well, now we better do because sustainability pressure is pushing us to learn new polymers. And some of the new polymer, PLA, P, HA, they are just mechanically so poor. So now we're invited to learn why they are so poor, how we can improve. Right? So that's, uh, uh, so in that sense, uh, uh, I'm, forgive me for being sketchy, uh, many of this is on the YouTube already. And these are some of the publications in, uh, when we cite in each of the continent. I sometimes call it episode one, two, three. Uh, so this is the end of it. Uh, I, I, I think uh, I usually just don't read it because you can read faster than I can globally do. Uh, uh, but basically we have uh, basically a, a good sightseeing. Uh, my student helped me uh, uh, catch all the beautiful scenes and, and learn where they come from. So with that, thanks. Your attention. Thank you very much.